to acknowledge that Canada coast to coast is land of First Nations and other indigenous groups, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Hello, my name is Mada Kiryonasi. I have a PhD in construction management, and today I'm preparing this this lecture for Professor Tamriel Dirabi's class at University of Toronto. What I will be talking about is infrastructure deterioration modeling. So infrastructure, physical infrastructure or tangible infrastructure, they deteriorate over time. And a key question in asset management is how to predict this deterioration in future. If you have a piece of road or a sewer, it doesn't matter what kind of infrastructure, it is going to deteriorate. And as an asset manager, it's our job to predict its deterioration. There are different types of models to do this, uh, and the models could be classified, in, classified into a variety of categories from different perspectives. One perspective is basically the model itself, like philosophically speaking, what type of model are we using? Are we using a mechanistic model or an empirical model or mechanistic empirical model? Mechanistic models are based on the laws of physics or fundamental laws basically and they take into account the material characteristics they are useful in design uh, but they are not uh, really complex enough to reflect the deterioration of a piece of infrastructure what i mean by laws of physics is um, are the laws that are unchangeable and they are true no matter where you are for example um, the second law of newton um, or when we say in uh, strength of material sigma equals to e epsilon that's basically a um, a mechanistic model because uh, when you um, when you stretch something when you pull some a material from two sides it's going to stretch right um, and things of that nature these are mechanistic models there is another category of models called empirical models. As the name suggests, they are based on um, doing numerous experiments and measuring the data and develop, developing statistical models. So the, this category of model only rely on statistics. And unlike a uh, mechanistic model, they could be correct in a certain circumstance, but in another one, they could be uh, very inaccurate. So what I mean by statistical model, for example, you measure the amount of precipitation and you correlate this with um, uh, the surface of road and its roughness. For example, you conclude that with 100 uh, additional millimeter of precipitation, the roughness increases by, by one unit, for example, one meter per kilometer. That's a lot, but um, as, a, as an example. So that's an, an empirical model. Uh, obviously, this type of model has its own limitation too because it should be recalibrated every time. And it doesn't take into account uh, some of the characteristics of, of the material. There is empirical mechanistic or mechanistic empirical ME models. These try to merge the two previous types of models and uh, develop model using both uh, mechanistic and empirical reasoning. So this is from one perspective. From another, another perspective, it is important to know what mathematical function or formula do you use for your modeling. Roughly, very broadly, models may be um, divided to deterministic models or probabilistic models and deterministic models as they as their name suggests they are deterministic they do not entertain probabilities but probabil probabilistic models on the other hand they can consider probability and tell you what is the probability of failure what is the probability of having this certain condition so in this slide, I tried to kind of put together a, um, a categorization of uh, these different models being um, probabilistic and deterministic and so on. 
And uh, this is a categorization that I am putting forward. And like every other classification or categorization, there is some element of reduction in it. Um, so you may not agree with some of it, but if we follow the, the, this path, for example, uh, first we have probabilistic models and deterministic models. Deterministic models could be empirical or mechanistic empirical, for example, and they could, they are usually based on one equation. Oftentimes, it could be a linear equation or a nonlinear equation. Probabilistic models use a mathematical uh, formula as well. For example, one big category of them are machine learning or AI, and machine learning algorithms themselves, they could be uh, divided into classifiers or, uh, for example, machine learning regression algorithm. Machine learning classifiers predict a class like KNN, decision tree, um, and so on. So in for a classifier, we are predicting a class, for example, good or bad, um, or acceptable, non-acceptable, things of that nature. But in regression models or machine learning regression models, we predict a value, for example, 100.2. There are other types of models, pro probabilistic models, that I am going to allude into and speak about almost all of them one by one with an emphasis on machine learning. So, um, so deterministic models, they, as I said, they predict a value or a class, they could be predicting each, either of these two, but they simply predict a single value or a class and not a probability. They could be linear, as I explained, uh, or nonlinear. Here you see a linear model developed for um, the deter for modeling the deterioration of buildings. And as you could see, it's simply a linear regression. A line fit into uh, a group of uh, points here, right? And therefore, its formula is going to be like a line as well. It's going to be a plus. Um, uh, bx, or in this case, b minus att mean time. Or the model could be nonlinear, like what we have here on the left, which is showing the deterioration of roads uh, based on age or based on time passed since its construction. And here we have three nonlinear curves or sigmoidal curves. They are very popular in the realm of pavement engineering. Um, and they are developed for three states in the United States, Arizona, Florida, and Utah. And as you could see, uh, this is quite nonlinear. And as you can see here, their formula is different from the linear, um, linear one. Here we are using a, an exponential function. Here we are using a linear function. This one is for pavement. This one is for buildings. But one thing that these two have in common other than being deterministic, it's the fact that they are both empirical, meaning that they are correlating deterioration to one factor that is not, uh, that is simply based on statistic. Uh, it's based on this regression formula they found, which is in this case, the, that attribute is age. So if you take a set of other buildings, they do not necessarily um, fit into this model, or if you take a set of different roads in another state or another jurisdiction, they do not necessarily be similar to this curve. They may be different. Um, but anyway, so so they are, in this case, deterministic and, um, as I said, empirical. Deterministic models could be also mechanistic empirical. This is a an example by Ashto uh, in their famous uh, mechanistic empirical pavement design guide. Uh, I think it's a 2008, yes, 2008 manual. And uh, you could see here that IRI is correlated with several dif different factors that have to do with material characteristics or the uh, environmental factors and so on and so forth. So IRI, for those who are not familiar, I hope you already know about this, but it's International Roughness Index. It's 
a measure of how rough pavement is. And I'm going to come back to this in the rest of the presentation. But anyways, you could see uh, IRA is correlated with initial IRI, this SF factor, which is side factor. It also has a bunch of other attributes in it, including precipitation and so on, and rut depth and fat, uh, fatigue cracking and so on. So this one, again, a deterministic model, but a um, type of uh, mechanistic empirical model. One way in deterministic models, a good way to use this type of model is to, if I go to the previous slide, instead of using simply one line, one good trick is to use the 95% confidence interval. That way we could have a range instead of just one single line and sort of could take into account some of the uh, stochasticities about these models. So with that, I am going to talk about probabilistic models a little bit. And uh, I could, again, categorize them into maybe three main categories. Um, again, people may use a different set of categorization. Um, feel free to do so. Uh, but in my view, they may be uh, categorized as reliability-based models, such as structural reliability analysis or survival curves. And random processes, um, examples are Markov models or gamma process. And at the end, machine learning or artificial intelligence, as well as uh, known as uh, uh, AI. So examples are neural networks or examples of machine learning algorithms or decision trees, random forests, and so on. So let's get into them and see what they are about one by one. So reliability-based models, as their name suggests, they are based on reliability theory. And it's reliability theory itself is a very broad field of uh, uh, theory, mathematical theory, which is modeling material or a, an infrastructure or an asset or essentially a, uh, a, an app object, an equipment, or whatever it is, uh, using mathematical formula and statistical uh, probabilistic distributions. For example, there is a big field in civil engineering and in structural analysis known as structural reliability or reliability of structures. It is based on the same reliability theory that they model loads and resistances of material uh, with probabilistic dis distribution and they can model the probability of failure. So one of the common models used in this um, in this category is known as survival curve, which is based on survival analysis. And survival analysis is essentially explaining the time to failure, which means, for example, if you have a set of buildings, how long does it take this certain building for its window to fail or for its wall to um, degrade into a certain uh, condition? And this is called time to failure. And we use uh, survival analysis to do so. This is used in medicine as well for patients and so on. Here's an example, the graph that you could see here. It's from this paper and it is showing a two uh, curves, which are known as survival curves. And they are developed using this, uh, me this method called Kaplan-Meier estimator, which is essentially uh, saying what percent of these um, these buildings are going to survive over over these years, so from zero to 100 years, and you could see that the residential building, the blue curve, and the solid curve, um, it is um, overperforming the non-residential building, which is the dashed curve down there. And as you could see, for example, at any certain point, let's say in the beginning in the LD 20 years, they are both having a very good um, function and they both survive pretty much. But by year 50, almost 50% um, almost of the, the non-residential buildings are expected to fail. So another category of probabilistic models are process, uh, random processes. And these random processes, um, they may be um, state-based, 
uh, and state-based usually refers to a discrete model. And um, a very famous example of this category of models is Markov model. Um, and gamma distribution is another example, but Ma Markov model is widely used and very famous. So, hopefully you are familiar with um, Markov models and uh, or in the next lectures, maybe you would get to learn about them. But um, I have a, um, a few examples here showing what a Markov model is and what is a uh, random process and discrete event simulation. In a Markov model, what we do is we have a system and we want to model the probability of this system transitioning from a certain state to another state. What does this mean? So imagine you have this, I hope this example is not too simplistic. I would use an example of uh, infrastructure as well, but because you have not uh, got into this part, I use this, this simple example as well. So you have this system being this basketball here, and it's in condition one or state one, or in this case, it's on, on this stair on number one, stair number one. And it could fall down and transition to another state, state number two or condition two, but it could also transition to four or five or three or any of that. In So what we do is we try to model the probability of either of these transitions. So in our case that we are interested in the, the, the deterioration of infrastructure because it's a one-way process, meaning that when a road is deteriorating, it is not going to heal by itself usually. So the probability of, for example, coming back from stage uh, five or state five to state uh, one is most probably zero, right? Uh, but the other way around, uh, the process is going to happen uh, very likely. So let's look at an example of infrastructure. Um, this one is, I believe, uh, modeling buildings with five classes. And as you could see, when we have five classes in our graph that is showing our, our Markov model, we will have five, um, uh, five nodes. So node one is showing condition one, condition two, node two, and so on until five. And the arrows here are showing the probability of transitioning to another state. In this case, this um, arrow going from one to one is showing that is representing the probability of staying in the same condition, which is 40%. But with a 30% probability, this um, uh, this building or this asset is going to transition to condition two or state two. Uh, with one being the best state and five the worst. So to do the number crunching, to do the analysis in this case in a Markov model, we usually use this matrix, which is called transition probability matrix or TPM. And this TPM is actually representing this network here. And as you could see, A11, meaning element uh, 11 of this matrix is 0 0.4, which is showing the probability of transitioning from node 1 to 1. There you go. And for example, 1, 5 is this one, which is the probability of going from 1 to stage 5, which is 0. So if we could form this matrix for any asset or any uh, piece of road or building or whatever asset we have, we could predict the probability of deteriorating to a certain uh, condition in the future. And this is, in a nutshell, what Markov uh, analysis is about in the realm of uh, uh, pavement performance modeling or infrastructure deterioration modeling in a broader sense. So that brings us to last but not least, perhaps one of the most important um, categories, which is machine learning or AI, um, sometimes referred to as data analytics. Um, and I would like to use this famous figure known as CRISP and it is showing the process of developing a model and how basically data analysis works. Again, I hope that you have a background, a general understanding of what machine learning is or what data, how data analysis works. But if you don't, it's okay, I'm going to explain in um, a few seconds. So basically in 
data analysis, we get a bunch of data, we show this data to our model and quote unquote train the model and the model is going to be trained on a set of data and we keep another set of data known as test set and we are going to test the model using that test set. It is like a student who has an exam tomorrow and we give a bunch of questions to the student to prepare on them. We call those questions training set. When the student prepared, we would give him or her the exam, which is the test set to make sure that they learned what they are supposed to learn. And machine learning is exactly the same thing. Instead of a student or a child, we are trying to teach a machine how to think, a computer how to think or classify or predict a value. So in a nutshell, that's what machine learning or data analysis is. Uh, but very sorry for the, again, simplistic uh, explanation. Hope you have a little bit of background already. But um, this figure is showing the process of how a data analysis project works. And as you could see, data is very central. Data quality is integral to data analysis. Without quality data, we cannot go far. Um, the first step is to understand what problem are we looking at. For example, are we looking at modeling the deterioration of pavement? If yes, what performance indicator are we using? IRI, PCI, SCI, and why is that? And then what type of data do we have? Do we have data on distresses? Do we have data on environmental factors? Do we have data on uh, managerial regime or maintenance and so on? And then data preparation. What changes should we make to the data to put it into the right format? Do we have to replace any um, fields? Are there missing data in there? And are there faulty data, erroneous data? For example, if you have a set of roads and um, you see that the condition improves without any maintenance, that's probably an example of a faulty data because usually the condition either stays the same or deteriorates over time. Or if you have a, so there are, there are a ton of methods to um, do each of these steps. For example, in preparation, you could use a distribution, for example, a normal distribution and get rid of the outliers, um, not get rid of them, like you don't have to always get rid of them. In fact, you should not. Some of the outliers are, are valid and they represent something but a lot of times they may be faulty. You should, again, using your business understanding, look into it and assess that. So after preparing the data and putting it into the right format, you start modeling. This is what we will be talking about in today's uh, presentation. You, there are a suite of options that you could use. Um, and after finishing the model, you would evaluate it to see how accurate it is. Is it any good or not? And then, eventually you would implement your model. So with that, I'm going to um, explain a uh, part of what I did for my PhD work, which included deterioration modeling for pavement. And uh, it was used, it was based on machine learning algorithms. Um, and the, the uh, the pavement performance indicators I used were pavement condition index and international roughness index. The first one is known as PCI. The second one is known as IRI. PCI is a measure of how well the condition of road is. For example, if there are no distress on your road, your PCI is 100. Um, and when it starts to deteriorate, for example, you have a pothole, your PCI may fall to 70 and so on. Uh, IRI, on the other hand, is a measure of how rough your road is. A brand new road may have an IRI of, for example, 0 0.6 or 0 0.8 meter per kilometer. And when the road deteriorates, obviously its roughness is going to increase. And I tried to, in this project, I tried to use data that is um, affordable and data that is available to municipalities or DOTs like um, environmental data, including climatic data. And um, I tested a variety of different algorithms and I tried to look into the impact of climate change, something that I 
I'm not going to talk about today. Um, it's out of this the scope of this presentation, but uh, this is what you could do as well when you have climatic uh, attributes. So this slide shows the um, the schematic um, representation of my models. So and basically many machine learning models are like this. Uh, essentially, I had the current condition of my rows being initial IRI or PCI and a set of predictors or attributes or variables, um, including precipitation, freeze index, freeze thaw, maintenance history, traffic, and so on. And I trained algorithms to predict the future condition of rows. For example, as I said, if we are predicting PCI, you could be predicting a value from 0 to 100. Or you could be predicting a class because ASTM uh, divides PCI into seven classes, um, good all the way to fail. So pr for predicting a class, we use a classifier. For predicting a value, we are using a number, a um, in fact a regression algorithm. And here are the, some of the algorithms that I tested. Decision tree can and random, for, random forest, gradient boosted trees, naive based classifier, naive based classifier coupled with kernel, uh, logistic regression, random forest regression. And I will explain some of them briefly. This slide is showing the methodology of what I did. So, one very important, uh, perhaps the most important component of a data analysis project is the data. It's the first step and perhaps the most important. You should make sure you have reliable data and you understand the data and the data represent the problem that you're uh, looking to, to, to solve. In this case, I use LTPP database. LTPP stands for Long-Term Pavement Performance. It's a database collected by Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, since 1980s. And it is the data of roads in North America, meaning uh, United States and Canada. And so I use this data set and similar data sets, for example, MTO data or maybe sometimes Ontario municipalities data. And I also study the asset management plans that were developed in Ontario to learn about their business processes, what type of data do they collect and so on. I obviously talk to experts about uh, the features or the attributes that I should be using for prediction. I studied TAC um, guidelines and IPCC. IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, uh, which um, has um, uh, guidelines on climate change. And I use this IPCC thing for IPCC report for um, finding the, the attributes that are relevant to uh, climate change. And the steps for this project were very similar to other um, data, analysis, uh, data analysis efforts. So I had to first retrieve the data because it was in a SQL database. So I had to write queries and um, in fact, like extract the data and then start to prepare it and clean it. As I explained, a lot of times data have a faulty um, inputs or faulty numbers in them and you have to get rid of them or replace them with the right number. Another part of the preparation is simply joining different tables together because for example this data set has several hundred tables and each data is stored in a table so you have to write queries to join the data together and training the models and testing it or evaluating it and eventually implementing the model to be able to use them. Um, so I one of the one of the performance indicators I used was PCI, and there was a problem. There was no PCI in LTPP database. So what I did was, excuse me, what I did was I tried to use the ASTM methodology to calculate um, PCI from the distresses. Uh, distresses meaning fatigue cracking or uh, potholes or um, uh, flushing and the, these different types of or rutting or these different types of distresses that we have. So I had to um, 
automate the PCI calculation because there was thousands of examples of roads there and I couldn't just go through the ASTM methodology and do this um, manually. But there was a problem that the ASTM curves were very um, not really easy to use and they were not digitized at all. They were very old. So to be clear, this one is the curve. This is from a, an ancient book and I can't help it really how similar they are. <laughs> but what I did was I tried to digitize these curves uh, that I will talk about in in a second how I did it. Essentially what I did, let me go back. Uh, what I did, I picked a number of points here and I fitted curves to them to find the mathematical formula. But anyway, before that I would like to explain also how PCI itself is calculated uh, because this may be useful. PCI, as I said, it stands for Pavement Condition Index, and it is a um, sort of a an aggregate, an aggregated um, index showing how well the road is doing. And what we do to calculate PCI is that we collect collect data on these different distresses, for example, edge cracking, pothole, um, alligator cracking. We calculate something called the jock value using the, the ASTM graphs. ASTM has a bunch of graphs for these distresses. And then, as I said, I had to find the formula for them, which I did. Uh, here's an example for pothole. Um, as you can see, it's a polynomial function. And later, we have to correct these deduct values in another step and use this set of care that I have to, again, find the formula for them. I am going to explain how I extracted the formula I already did. Uh, so essentially, by picking a number of points on the curve and trying to reverse engineer and fit a curve into it and find the formula for that, um, that certain curve. So, and here is a flowchart of how to calculate PCI. Uh, if you go to ASTM, it is explained very well. If you go to my papers, uh, you could see this flowchart and it is explained there as well. So as you could see, it's a repetitive process calculating PCI. Therefore, computers could do very well in it. And this PCI calculation was needed to uh, train the, the, the algorithms. My analysis had a few facets, as I briefly explained before. Uh, the, the type of algorithm itself was important, what algorithm to use, because it's not a trivial choice. But because um, I was doing a scientific study, I um, trained different algorithms and compared them and made some points about using different types of techniques. The data size is very important, and I look to the impact of it. The informativeness of attributes. What attribute is more informative? Meaning that if we are to you, if we are to choose, say, um, thirty attributes out of thirty thousand attributes, which attributes should we pick? This was actually what I did. Like, for perhaps the um, LTPP database has thousands of um, attributes in it because it has hundreds of tables so probably uh, in the order of hundreds or thousands of features as well which one are the features that are the most important for us and i use different types of analysis such as using uh, confusion matrix using using random uh, using ranking algorithms and there are other ways and uh, finally Getting to know your data by segmenting your data is important too because the data set that I was using, LTPP, it is not like the data of a municipality or even a DOT. It is collected all over North America. So if you're not careful, there's a lot of noise in it and a lot of uncertainty that could cause uh, damage to your model and make your model really inaccurate. So uh, you could look into subsets of this data and see how it is going to affect your, your model. For example, the data of a certain climatic region or the data of roads with a certain maintenance pattern. These are all important, uh, important features. Um, so as I said, the first step is data retrieval followed by data preparation and cleaning. 
for um, data retrieval, I in I extracted more than 3,000 records for PCI and around 30,000 examples for IRI. The, I'm referring to the clean data. The original data was obviously bigger. And uh, the the preparation and cleaning I already explained. It had I had a few problems first not having PCI, so I had to spent uh, several months preparing the, the PCI data, getting rid of the erroneous examples, um, replacing the missing data. For example, traffic data was missing in many cases or other, other examples like uh, maintenance data sometimes were missing. So I had to either replace them or do something about them. And feature selection, again, which attributes to choose, uh, in, in this case, our criteria was the cost of collection of that data and whether it's available to municipalities. And another key consideration was, uh, can we use this in climate change analysis? And climate change is um, uh, something that we could examine using this broad data set. And why is that? Because if you look at this broad data set, this LTPP data, it's collected all over North America from Texas to uh, Manitoba. So what I'm saying, what I want to say is uh, there's this study by these researchers at this link if you go to it is showing that climate change is really affecting our communities in our cities and the climate of our cities and say by 2080 depending on wh which climate scenario you pick it is going to be very different for example toronto according to these um, authors it's going to look like new york city or maybe somewhere yeah new york city almost or Montreal itself is going to look like New York too. New York itself is going to look like another city down there. So having this very broad data that is collected all over North America, it gave us the opportunity to be able to look into the impact of climate change as well. Okay, so the algorithms, we get to talk about the algorithms now. As I said, um, one of the limitations of these these empirical models that I already explained what they are about. A limitation of them is that they are based on um, attributes that are basically only statistically correlated with the, um, the health of pavement, in this case, PCI. And a lot of times, municipalities or U DOTs, they simply use age-based deterioration models. And they could be a little bit misleading. This is a good example by this author. And um, as you could see here, we have three deterioration curves, um, Arizona, Florida, and Utah. And we naturally expect the deterioration curve for, for example, Arizona to be the least perhaps, or at least less, uh, less aggressive than uh, Utah and Florida. But what we see here is the opposite. The, the deterioration is very heavy, in fact, in Arizona roads here in this case. So if you draw a line, a vertical line here, you could see that the curve for Arizona is dropping very quickly. So why is that? So the reason for this um, discrepancy or apparent discrepancy is that the, this curve cannot take into account traffic. So the, 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 the data of the Arizona roads, they had a lot of trucks on them. So they, the, because the curve doesn't represent easels, it is very misleading if you, if you use this, this curve out of context, like for example, for another set of roads in the same state or another, in another place. A better way, as I said, is to use these uh, AI-based models. For example, here's an example, a decision tree, which is, um, a very popular algorithm and very easy to use and easy to interpret because of the, um, the graphical representation that it has. For example, here, this decision tree is saying, if your initial PCI is more than 74 and your road is uh, less than 13 years old and your minimum temperature is less than 11, your road is going to deteriorate into a fair condition. If your minimum temperature, annual temperature, is more than 11, it's going to probably stay in a satisfactory condition. Um, so as you could see, that machine learning algorithms can really mine high-dimensional data 
and learn very fastly from this this type of uh, this type of data. But this certain algorithm that I talked about, decision tree, it is great, but it has one problem. It is not accurate, and that is probably the most important thing that we look for in, in models, accuracy. So what to do to improve the accuracy of a decision tree? There are ways, there are, uh, ways to look into this. One way is to use ensemble learning algorithms. What is ensemble learning algorithm? As the name suggests, ensemble means a group of things, and ensemble learning is using a group of models instead of one model. So what ensemble learning is about is, so very simply, I would try to explain it. Imagine we have this data as a whole. What we do in an ensemble learning algorithm is, is we dissect the data into several subsets, say 300 subsets or 1,000 subsets, um, depending on, on um, uh, rule of thumb and also your, the size of your data. Here, for the sake of illustration, I only divided it into five subsets and uh, just to show how the, the, the model works. And for each of these subsets, we train a decision tree. So each of these subsets may have a subset of our features. For example, precipitation and PCI only, or one tree could be only developed based on PCI, nothing else. And so we make each of these trees make a prediction. Let's make them do that. So imagine we have this road and it has this initial conditions, PCI, AADT, and so on and so forth. Tree one is predicting fair in three years. This is the condition that it is predicting. Tree two is predicting satisfactory after three years. Tree three, uh, fair, fair, and good. And what we do is we collect the, the opinion or the prediction, in fact, the prediction of the models and we do a majority vote, we take a majority vote uh, in one type of model known as random forest. In this case, we have three models voting for fair and we get a fair uh, output so that we choose fair as the final output. But there is a problem with this version of ensemble learning and the problem is that sometimes some of these models are very inaccurate. For example, here's this tree tree number six, and this is a real tree. Uh, but it's obviously developed based on a part of the data, and its its prediction is fair, no matter what. So whatever data you fit into this tree, uh, you feed into this tree, it is going to give you the, the one and only outcome fair, which doesn't make sense. So what we do is we try to assign weights to these um, to these learners or base learners based on their um, accuracy. And this is what we call boosting. This is another type of um, ensemble learning. And in the case of decision trees, we call this gradient boosted trees algorithm. So in our study, we use gradient boosted trees algorithm as well. And as you could see here on the graph on, on the right, I'm trying to show the impact of um, gradient boosted trees. Here you have a single tree, this um, this one point here, the green point is showing a single decision tree. And this curve is showing using gradient boosted trees with different number of trees. So here you could see with only five trees, the accuracy has already increased. And we when we increase the number of decision trees or base learners or weak learners of the algorithm, you could see that the accuracy increased dramatically to 80 something for the same uh, for the same problem. On the left, I looked into the impact of the um, data size, and as you could see, obviously the more data we have, the more accurate and the more stable our model would be. I use different di other set of algorithms as well. Uh, an example is a uh, naive base classifier. A naive base classifier, you probably are familiar with this algorithm. It is very um, popular because it's very simple. 
it is assuming independence between the features. That's why it's called naive Bayes. And it is using Bayes rules to predict uh, a, certain, uh, a certain outcome. So imagine, this is the formula for naive Bayes. And it is saying, what is the probability of y, y being our target variable? For example, in this case, condition of roads. So what is the condition of a road being good given that given that it has this certain precipitation or this functional class or this traffic and so on. So Naive Bayes is saying, what is the probability of being in a condition or being in a certain state given these predictive attributes? And using Bayes rules, we uh, could uh, calculate it uh, using this formula. Uh, but there's the, the real problem in naive based classifiers is to have the distribution of this this probability and what a naive based classifier does for the um, for the discrete uh, variables it is going to just count them and use a histogram but for a continuous variable it is going to use normal distribution but there's a problem some of the so, sometimes the distribution of the data is not normal so this is using a normal distribution for a feature of our data set being freeze-thaw cycles, number of freeze-thaw cycles per year. But again, as I said, sometimes the real data is non-normal. So this is the real data distribution that we have. That is where we could use, oops, sorry. That is where we could use a type of estimator known as kernel density estimator. And it is essentially a localization technique that tries to estimate the the distribution of a um, of a curve like more realistically. And in this case, for example, we use three kernels to uh, estimate the probability the, 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 this uh, distribution function. So in the case of predicting uh, PCI, if we use a naive base classifier, the accuracy is only 55%, okay, which is really not high. But if we use uh, a uh, only three kernels to predict the distribution of that probability distribution, we get a 73% accuracy. And why is that? Because the, the, the distribution is more realistic. If, we, if it is estimated using this. And think about it, for example, in this case, if you look at the probability of having minus 20 freeze thaws, it is not zero in this curve, right? Uh, minus 10 freeze thaw cycles, which doesn't make sense because freeze thaw is a number. It's an integer between zero and uh, say 365 because you have 365 days per year. But here, that probability, the same probability is very close to zero. So the more, more realistic prediction re results in a more, more accurate model. And as you could see here, by including more kernels, the accuracy of the naive base include a, a, a increase from 55% to 90%. This is using another. This is slide is showing using another algorithm, KNN, and um, KNN um, stands for K nearest neighbor, and it is an algorithm based on measuring distance. Uh, therefore, because it is um, including distance in its prediction, it is very important to normalize the data. Here, here I try to show the accuracy of the KNN based on its only per parameter, the number of neighbors. Uh, but what I did was I normalized the data and once I did the prediction with our normalization. And the blue dots show uh, the accuracy after normalization and clearly it is way above the non-normalized data. And the reason again is that uh, we have to normalize it because it is using um, distance. It could be Euclidean distance in, in prediction. This slide is showing how by uh, segmenting the data into climatic region, you could increase the accuracy. You could refer to my papers to, to see um, how we 
segmented the data into different, for example, climatic regions, dry freeze, dry non-freeze, wet freeze, and wet non-freeze. And the model did a better job inside each of these subsets, despite the fact that the size of data decreased. So I'm going to go through this quickly and go to my next slides. This slide is important because it is showing an important evaluation technique known as confusion matrix. So a lot of times you, what you hear for a classifier is a, a one number evaluation. Say People say my classifier is 90% accurate or they say it's 50% accurate. So what does it mean? Okay, so you have this model that is 90% accurate. So we know that it is getting the answer right in 90% of the time. But what about the other 10%? How fatal are the mistakes that this model is making? Confusion matrix is a great way to look into this. And essentially what a confusion matrix is, it is representing the prediction of the model versus the real label of the data. So here, for example, this confusion matrix is saying our data was telling us that, in fact, there are 180 good uh, roads that the model predicted as good. But there were 38 roads that, in fact, were satisfactory, but the model predicted them as good. And there were 18 fair that were predicted as good, and so on and so forth. So the diagonal elements of this matrix is showing the right numbers, the, the, the accurate predictions, uh, which uh, result in accuracy if you just simply divide these elements by the sum of the numbers of the entire matrix. But let's look at another example. Here our model is predicting very poor, but in reality the, the road is going to be fair, right? So our model is underestimating the uh, the real output. So an underestimation is not as fatal as an overestimation because, for example, here our model is predicting good, but in reality the road is very poor. So that's a dangerous mistake to make because um, the road has failed and it's not in a good condition, and, but your model is saying otherwise. So this is a, a bad mistake. Uh, while the other mistake is not as bad or as fatal as the, 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 the overestimation mistake. So this is a very useful way to look into the number of overestimation or underestimation or false positive, false negative errors of our model. So what we did, uh, eventually we implemented all the algorithms and analysis into a web-based portal so people would be able to query their road and see it on a map and the um, the map would be colored accordingly according to the final uh, final condition of the road so what I mostly talked about here was about PCI and mostly about classifying algorithms or classification so in the rest of the presentation I have a few slides about IRI and also by reusing regression algorithms. So for the IRI, we conducted a similar analysis uh, with 30,000 examples because IRI data is um, uh, more available in the LTPP database because its collection is easier probably. And um, we train different algorithms, both classifiers and regression algorithms um, to predict them. And also, we develop several correlations between IRA and PCI. Here, I don't have time to explain the correlation between the two, and I, I recommend you go to our papers and look at uh, the points that are important when drawing correlations between the two. Uh, this slide is showing simply two correlations. Um, the one, the one on top from the LTPP data. So we dumped all our data in one spreadsheet and tried to fit one line into it, and the R-square was 30, 0.31. And we did this the same analysis with, for example, MTO data, and the correlation was um, almost twice bigger. R-square was almost twice bigger. And the reason is pretty obvious, because the MTO data belongs to one province, 
LTPP data is collected all over North America, basically 50 states plus Canada. And um, this one is collected over one year. This one has been collected over a variety of years. And um, f finally, uh, as I said, I don't have time to explain all this, but in our papers, we explain the um, um, risks of just simply using a correlation to translate one of these features to another. Uh, I recommend that, again, you look into them. This um, slide is pretty useful too, showing that how the algorithms did in predicting IRI versus PCI. So this row here is showing IRI prediction and the second row is showing PCI prediction. The first column shows the result of a linear regression, the simple linear regression that we are all familiar with. And the second column is showing a, an ensemble learning algorithm known as random forest regression. And um, so I think what is interesting here is that the linear model, the linear regression, did pretty well when uh, predicting IRI values, 0 0.9. And it's uh, random for, and the random forest regression uh, improved the results, but not really very considerably because the linear model already did a great job. But PCI that is more stochastic and has more subjectivity in it and more nonlinearity in it, in my view. Um, the, the, the linear algorithm, its R square was 56%. And when we use the, uh, the ensemble learning algorithm, the random forest regression, the accuracy was increased to 0 0.72 meaning that there was more room for improvement and the ensemble learning uh, did a good job in improving the, uh, the prediction accuracy. So that pretty much sums up uh, my presentation. I hope you found it useful and um, thank you for listening.